My name is Jim Oxberry, and I'm the executive director of the Western Cup Association. And I welcome everybody to the fabulous Ian Conkle uh, Buffalo Bill Center of the West. And uh, before I forget it, before we get uh, into the program, I do want to take a minute to thank the sponsors, EPA Species Conservation and ESA Initiative. Uh, this is a big deal for WGA and it would not be possible for uh, of our sponsors. Um, and at the top of the list is our initiative sponsor, uh, the Rocky Mountain, Mountain Health Foundation. Uh, also want to thank our workshop sponsor, NG, workshop supporter, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, who's also been provided by the great state of Wyoming and the Fish and Wildlife. It's an honor to serve as the director of the Western Governors Association. But it's also exhausting uh, because the governors are working, they're traveling at a thousand miles an hour from leadership to confront challenges facing our region and our nation. Uh, several of us were with Governor, Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper last Friday for a WGA sponsor launch. And he was comparing the Western Governors Association to his teenage a budding baseball player. Uh, he explained that when Teddy started out playing baseball as a preteen, uh, when he got up to the plate, he kept popping out because he had arm strength to follow through on the swing. Uh, but now uh, he's gained a lot of muscle, and because of that, he's consistently getting the ball to line drive. The past few years, the Western governors have gained a lot of muscle, and they're using it to consistently hit line drives. Uh, our chairman, Governor Matt Mead, has decided to use some of this strength to tackle one of the West's great challenges, uh, the conservation of species and improvements to the application of the uh, uh, Endangered Species Act. With today's workshop, Governor Meade kicks off a sprawling, comprehensive, big tent regional con conversation on species. Uh, this is a discussion that we're gonna have throughout the West at various workshops through webinars, uh, virtual town halls and other meetings. Uh, we want to learn from each other how to best manage species, about how to elevate the state's role in the implementation of the Species Act and, and how to make that act work better. There are lots of ongoing conversations about ESA. Uh, what distinguishes this one from Western governors? The most collegiate, bipartisan group of leaders for whom I have ever worked. Uh, since I started with WGA three years ago, I've been struck by their comedy, their level-headedness, their pragmatism, and their commitment to finding common sense by solutions. This initiative works to the to take a page from the Western Governors Playbook by showing respect to those with different points of view, by demonstrating sensitivity to others' circumstances. And most importantly, by working collaboratively to find common ground and develop creative solutions. In the past few years, I've had several opportunities to introduce Governor Meade, a leader for whom I have enormous respect, appreciation, and admiration. I've tried different approaches. I've, I've tried to be profound. Uh, I've tried to be funny. <laughs> exactly. It never works. You know? I've, I've tried to be uh, informative, but the one thing I've never tried uh, is to be brief. Um, so I'm going to give that a go this time and introduce to you now the 32nd great state of Wyoming and the chairman of the Western Governors Association, the Honorable Matt Mead. Thank you. I'm wondering if every brief is back, so thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, just say, uh, Jim, thank you very much uh, for kicking this off. And thank you for your leadership uh, for the Western uh, For those of you who may not follow the Western Governors Association closely, uh, under Jim's leadership, uh, the organization has absolutely flourished uh, for your efforts uh, and your hard work. I thank each of you uh, for being here today on um, an issue that is so important to the West and frankly to the nation. After uh, here, I've got to uh, 
one other speech here in Cody, and then I'm off to Stanford University uh, to give a speech. The irony in that is that if my high school teachers could have taken a mile of Stanford, it would be something <laughs> with Stanford. In Stanford, uh, I'm giving a speech, and it's titled The uh, States of the West. As part of that, and as part of why we are here today, those who are fortunate enough to live in the West, we recognize that the West would not be the West without wildlife, without the that we have in this part of the country. It is unquestionably one of the things that enriches our lives to have wildlife, the habitat, and all that goes with that in terms of quality and our economy. And I can't think of a better place to kick this off than right here in Cody, Wyoming, where we're on the doorstep of the first national park, the Yellowstone National Park. But this is just a start. The conversation will continue throughout the region. And for those of you who's taking notes, the next meeting will be happening in on January 19th. Very exciting, uh, not to talk about wolves, but in Hawaii, on um, February 12th, we talk about species. Uh, and then in March, we do not yet have a date. Uh, there will also be uh, another meeting. We may have a couple of things, but uh, there may be yet an additional meeting in California. Uh, we're not sure of that yet, and yet uh, we don't know the date. But the two that we do know about are Boise, Idaho, and uh, Wahoo, Hawaii on February 12th. And it's important to have the different meetings in different regions in the West because some of the concerns uh, expressed in those different regions may be different than what we uh, outlined here today. So this is the first of four, maybe five workshops uh, to address the, the uh, ESA. So I said, it's, I can't think of a better place to get this started than here in Cody, here in this beautiful facility. Uh, I think it's just unbelievable what we care about this part of the West. So over the next year, uh, we're gonna be working on the interspecies. species. So let's start with why did I choose that as my initiative? Well, there's a couple of things that go with that. First is, it wasn't just important as an initiative, but I view the Western Governors Association as the right group to address this. Jim has already mentioned this somewhat, but the Western Governors Association, for those of you uh, maybe not familiar, it is a bipartisan organization. It's uh, Republicans and Democrats. And usually the way it goes is uh, one year there'll be a Republican chairman and the next year there'll be a Democrat chairman. I'm chairman for a year, and the next chairman will be Steve Bullock, Democrat uh, from Montana, and he is currently the, uh, the vice chairman and does a wonderful job. But the Western Government Association, despite the fact that uh, we come from uh, different political parties, the governors do, um, is a very pragmatic organization. And I would say the goal of Western Government Association is we recognize we have political different points of view, but we focus on areas where there is a common interest, and in those areas of common interest, we put politics aside in favor. And so it's not just here, it's not just this uh, initiative. It is the right tool for this initiative, the Western Government Association. And as you view, there are many sponsors of the Western Government Association, like the diversity with the governors, there's diversity in sponsors. You have a number of different interest groups that help sponsor the Western Government Association. And I think that is so recognized that it is not a partisan organization, it is an organization that is tried to set up to try to address issues critical to the West. The nuts and bolts of why this is my mission, the Endangered Species Act, uh, created in 1973. Since globally, 2000. 220 species have been listed. Of that 2,000 plus, 59 have been delisted. So 2,220 listed. Of those delisted, there's a further breakdown. 
10 of those have been delisted, um, unfortunately, because of extinction. extinction. 19 have been delisted because of errors having them listed in the first place. So 29 out of the 59 delisted were not because they were covered. Of those, 20 have been listed. 30 have been delisted because of recovery. That's 1.3%. My view is this critical to the West habitat and wildlife. We need better than 1% success rate. So I chose this initiative because it is critical in the West to get this right. It's critical for our wildlife, it's critical for our energy sector, recreation, tourism, government, all of these things we cherish here in the West. In Wyoming, we have had experiences with the Endangered Species Act. We've had successes, and we've had things that have been sources of frustration. We have found often that the ESA generates endless lawsuits, which are costly, time-consuming, and frankly, do little at all to help the species. Let's take a couple of examples. Grizzly bears. 1975, they were listed as a threatened species. In 1993, there's a recovery old set of factors, including what the total number should be. And in 1993, that number was set at 500. Currently, which we believe are very conservative estimates, there's 757 grizzlies uh, in the greater Yellowstone area. Grizzly bears uh, affect not just uh, the hunters, and they certainly do that, but they affect other areas as well. For example, the last death for grizzly bears was in the mid 1980s. Since 2010, there have been six grizzly bear deaths. We love the fact that we live in a state where you know, I have the good fortune of flying to. Uh, many airports uh, in the state of Wyoming. And it always strikes me as I fly in the airport, you see these security fences around our airports. And you know, this, as it is, is designed to keep the bad guys out, but in Wyoming, to keep the wildlife out. <laughs> is that a great state or what? <laughs> yeah, I love that. <laughs> but we also know that here in this part of the state, uh, we have schools. That put fences to the terms of kids. And so, as we have examined this, and as we see the grizzly bear numbers go up, as we see the Fish and Wildlife Service, Fish and Wildlife Service to get the bear delisted, and then the challenge in court, and then the concerns about white bark pine and the decline of white bark pine. And that was examined. And interestingly enough, as white bark pine is going down, grizzly bear numbers go up. If we know one thing about grizzly bears, they are good eaters. Uh, they can eat a lot of different food sources, and we've seen the grizzly bear population flourish. So this is an example, in my mind, where as now, we continue to work with the Fish and Wildlife Service. I work directly with uh, Director Ash, and he and I are trying to find a path forward to get the grizzly bear delisted. But it draws the question, we can agree on numbers. We can agree that a species is recovered. The Fish and Wildlife Service, the state of Wyoming, can agree on a plan going forward. But too often, that means nothing. Which leads me to another example, the gray wolf. I know most of you are familiar with the gray wolves. They were reintroduced in Wyoming in the mid-1990s, 20 years ago. Decades of litigation followed and it continues to this day. So when I came into office uh, in 2011, I then worked directly with Secretary Salazar and Director Ash on how to address the wolves. I did not have any interest in continuation after litigation after litigation without getting somewhere. I was keenly interested in getting the wolves under state management because Wyoming Wildlife belongs 
two. And I think in a fairly unique negotiation process, uh, we spent time one-on-one -on -one with Secretary Salazar, with uh, Director Ash. We did a big outreach uh, to NGOs, uh, to groups like the Stock Growers Association, wildlife groups, ranchers, industry, trying to figure out where is the right path forward for wolves. And as you know, uh, we reached an agreement with Secretary and Director Ash. We had a state plan, and the state plan, while not perfect, was designed to continue to have a healthy wolf population, but provide the balance that is needed to provide state management. That plan, in my mind, was not only working, it was working extremely well. And then we run into the problem, a problem with the Endangered Species Act, and that is uh, we hit the courtroom again. <clears throat> sort of an incredible thing happened that I think highlights maybe more than anything why we collectively need to look at the Endangered Species Act. And that was this. The court found the wolves have recovered. And the court found that the plan was not sufficient. And this is what we face with the Endangered Species Act. We need to be able to get to a place where these whispers of shoot, shovel, and shut, shut up are no longer present. We need to have the Endangered Species Act viewed as a good news story. We need to have a day coming when Rancher Joe or Jill finds a threatened or endangered species on their place. They don't view it as the ultimate bad news, but instead they view it as a celebration of the stewardship that they've had that allowed a species to survive that. Because now, I think too often, the Endangered Species Act is viewed in negative terms. It is going to be a bad news story. It's going to shut you down. We need to have a place and a time where there is a clear goalpost. And we need to be able to have some of the NGOs say, but for our work, that we wouldn't be in this place. But now, for example, with wolves, rather than let's go back to court, Let's have a celebration party. We've won the game, the whistle's been blown. We don't need to get back on the field and score another touchdown. This is a good news story. We need good news stories. And we need it not just so that we can provide predictability to businesses and industry. We need it for species. How much money, time, effort, we spend like the gray wolf, the courts say have recovered and we're ignoring species that actually need help, where we should be putting our focus and time and energy and money on. And when you're at 1%, a little over 1% actual recovery, we're not addressing the other 200 and whatever. And we need to be doing that. So this is part of the reason that uh, I think it's so important for all of you to be here. And I'll just say, if we're gonna make improvements to the Endangered Species Act, a couple things want to have to happen. One is we collectively have to have the courage and we have to have the faith that people of good faith with good intentions can work together and put together something to present not only in Western governors but broader than that, the National Government Association level and in Congress and we're not going to have a runway in one way or another. And there's evidence that this can be done. And the evidence, I would say, is the sage grouse. The sage grouse, as you all know, has been in the news, been on our minds uh, in the West uh, for many years now. And when the courts got involved, I would say that uh, a lot of states sort of gave up on it. Uh, but Governor Friedenthal and his administration and the many good NGOs, I see the Audubon Society here as an example, many others said, no, we're not going to just let it lie. We're going to figure out a path forward of how we can get this done. And the sage grouse, and what I view as the success on the sage grouse, did not come about by one faction or one interest group charged forward and taking it. It came by by the sage grouse implementation team 
that very diverse group having that confidence and having that faith that well-intentioned people working together can find solutions, that we can do this, that actual improvements can be made. Now I'll say with regard to the Endangered Species Act, you know, the, what was done with the sage grouse, and not just in Wyoming, but in the West, that collective effort with NGOs, with industry, with the local government, the state government, it was done almost in spite of where we are with the Endangered Species Act. But we can learn from that. And we can learn from it and use it in this process of how we can have these different points of view come together and say, of that 2,220, we want to start chopping away at that. And we don't want to start chopping away with it by just delisting things for no reason. We want to start chopping away with it because we do a better job actually preserving species. And then we reach goal lines and then we move on to the next species. So this is how we're going to do this. We want to figure out how to elevate the role of the states. We want to figure out how to best use state management. We want to make decisions on how the Nature Species Act statute could be more efficient and more effective overall. You know, the state of Wyoming, uh, as I said, and not unique to the state of Wyoming, but we all care about the wildlife. It is the West, it's who we are, it adds to our quality of life. And when you see successes like the black footed ferret, which I'm so proud of the effort for many years of Wyoming and leading the way on that. And uh, maybe it's uh, recently they were uh, released uh, in Colorado. These are good news stories. We want more of those good news stories. But it will not happen if it is just Republicans or it's just Democrats or if it's just industry or if it's just NGO. We all need to come together and have confidence in working together we can find these solutions. Because when you're at 1% success rate, when more than any other species, lawyers have recovered, <laughs> <laughs> we are not in a good place. Lawyers are not threatened, and they are not in danger. They are thriving. <laughs> and any court would agree with that. So let's take this morning to set a good path for the meetings that will occur across the West. Let's build on this, and in March, uh, that is the last meeting, prepare for our June Western Governors meeting in Jackson, where we can have some solutions. Let's take those solutions to the National Governors Department of the National Natural Resources and build even a broader coalition. And from there, Let's take a good work product that comes from diverse point of views to Congress and say, we want to do better with regard to species. We want to do better with regard to the Endangered Species Act. 1% has never been viewed as success in the United States. And something as important as species, wildlife, habitat, we need to do better. I'm convinced that we can. I'm convinced the Western Government Association is the right course going with the help of all of you, with your diverse points of view, came together in good faith, we can still make progress on issues of importance to the West and the United States. So with that, thank you for being here. Uh, get to work. All of you get paid nothing. <laughs> but let's go. I think we have a great opportunity right now to make great improvements on this very important issue. Thank you very much for your time. It's my pleasure to introduce Gary Fraser from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Gary is the Assistant Director for Endangered Species at the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Mr. Fraser started his career with the service in 1984 at a field office in Virginia. Since then, he has worked in a variety of capacities within the service, at one point serving as the Assistant Director for Fisheries and Habitat Conservation. Mr. Fraser, there is no doubt that you have immense experience working to conserve species and implement provisions of the Endangered Species Act. We thank you very much for taking the time to join us here in Cody 
and share your perspectives on how we can identify bipartisan solutions to make the act work better, not only for those working on the ground, that we all agree merit conservation. Thank you, David. Well, good morning. My name is Seth. I'm the assistant director for ecological services. I used to be assistant director for endangered species. My portfolio expanded a little bit. Um, but that job title is just a, a title. What I really do, I can describe in a little simpler terms. I'm the senior career guy that oversees implementation of the Endangered Species Act for the, for the Fish and Wildlife Service. I've been in this position on and off for about 14 years now. So I've been around the Endangered Species Act block a few times. Um, but I can truthfully say that um, I learn something new every day about how we can make this law work more effectively for the species that need help and for the public that, that we all serve. <laughs> so let me begin by first thanking Governor Mead for launching this, this initiative and hosting this workshop. The Fish and Wildlife Service greatly appreciates your leadership in examining species conservation and implementation of the endangered species that can be improved. The governor's decision to approach this in a bipartisan fashion and to examine all angles, legislative, administrative, things that are within the range of the Endangered Species Act, things that are outside of the ESA, is really encouraging and it offers great promise for this being a very productive effort. I'm sure I don't have to tell you that many discussions about the Endangered Species Act, particularly those back in Washington, D.C., um, don't quite have that, that approach, or a bit more polarized. Um, and they start with an ideological bent from the outset. And those discussions generally are not productive. This law was enacted in a bipartisan fashion, and all successful efforts to amend it to date have been bipartisan in nature. And all our important administrative improvements in the Fish and Wildlife Service, no surprises, assurances, safe harbor agreements, came to conservation agreements with assurances. They've been built around the common sense middle ground that can generally be supported by all sides. Not supported wholeheartedly every aspect, but there's something there that addresses the needs of all parties. So that's why we're encouraged by this initiative. It's led by state executives with a proven track record of finding solutions and getting things done. It's starting without a predefined outcome other than to improve species conservation and implementation of the Endangered Species Act. And it's reaching out to all parties for ideas and experiences. I think the lineup today and tomorrow morning is really outstanding. There's a tremendous wealth of knowledge in this room. Conservation of endangered species and keeping species from reaching that point is not a simple job. We found that crafting lasting solutions, solutions that don't entail winners and losers, but that everyone can find something to get behind, it takes a lot of listening and an open mind. <laughs> I'm proud that the service and our many partners are crafting solutions and making real progress on endangered and at-risk species conservation. The greater sage grouse was recently found to not warrant listing because of exactly that, this landmark range-wide conservation effort that was launched by the affected state. Wyoming was in the lead on that. Um, landowners and federal agencies all came together with a common objective to secure the status of the species and we're able to succeed in getting the species and its threats to a point where we did not have to, to accept the protections of the Endangered Species Act. An important part of that effort and successful conservation efforts for other species, like the New England Cottontail, has been the outstanding commitment and accomplishment of the Natural Resources Conservation Service in encouraging species conservation on private lands through their Working Lands for Wildlife Initiative. We in the Fish and Wildlife Service put on our creative thinking caps and found a way to provide participating landowners with the predictability that they'll be in compliance with the ESA if the species were ever to have to be listed in the future. It's that sort of creative thinking and development of new programs and approaches that are sensitive to the needs of landowners and other affected parties that, that serve to make this law work. And in the last couple of years, the dune sagebrush lizard, the Sonoran desert tortoise, the coral pink sand dunes, tiger beetle, um, were all found to not warrant listing because of voluntary conservation efforts 
that work to improve their status or reduce the threats that they faced. And after many years of effort, we are recovering and delisting species at an unprecedented pace. We'd like it to be more. These are challenging um, goals to, to meet. And many of these species have suffered massive habitat loss or dealing with really pervasive threats that are not easy to undo overnight. But the fact that they are still in existence, that they have not, in fact, gone extinct, that the protections of the act is keeping them as part of our natural biodiversity is itself a great success. We are on track by the end of this administration to delist due to recovery more species than all previous administrations combined. Our collective effort over time is starting to really pay off. We're on a path to recovery for the black-footed ferret, a species once thought to be extinct, and that was rebuilt from a tiny population that was rediscovered here in Wyoming, in Matipsi, just down the road from here. Key to this recovery is the voluntary, incentive-based approach to working with ranchers who are willing to have prairie dogs and black-footed ferrets as part of the ranching operation. That's not an easy, easy lift, I can assure you. But if we can help ranchers stay ranching and have black-footed ferrets benefit as a result, then that's our idea of a good, lasting solution. But there is a lot more to do, many tough problems that we have yet to overcome. And for a challenge as big as species conservation and an act as far-reaching and consequential as the Endangered Species Act, we can never stop learning and evolving. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service certainly does not have all the answers. And we welcome this initiative by the WGA to identify new and improved tools and approaches to conserve the plants and animals that enrich our lives and make our nation such a unique and special place. So thank you. good, lasting solution. But there is a lot more to do, many tough problems that we have yet to overcome. And for a challenge as big as species conservation and an act as far-reaching and consequential as the Endangered Species Act, we can never stop learning and evolving. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service certainly does not have all the answers. And we welcome this initiative by the WGA to identify new and improved tools and approaches to conserve the plants and animals that enrich our lives and make our nation such a unique and special place. So thank you.